Is this an olive oil? That's fire. That's good. That's good. I think I just created my own pair of street food right there. Bonjour. 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 Ooh, look at that stretch. Slapping on the pork floss and the, and the fried onions and... Ah. Dollar for dollar, better than America. This is my favorite Rojamo I've ever had. Shout out to TSA for letting the six ounce bottle through, but. Is the pho any good in Paris? Do baguettes make the bun mi better? Is Italy's Chinese food underrated? And how's the McDonald's? Watch as I take a trip to Paris, France, and Florence, Italy to try some local eats, but also to check out what the Asian diaspora got going on. All right, guys, our first spot in Chinatown, or AKA Quartier Asiatique, uh, is going to be Pho Da Bo, which is uh, highly recommended by a friend whose family lives in Paris, and they said that this spot is pretty good for Pho. Is it the best top spot? I don't know, but it's probably pretty good. So this is our first spot in Chinatown. I'm going to go get some bum mies later, but let's check this out and compare it to America. All right, let's take a look at this menu real quick. I think most spots out here actually serve a number of Hanoi style pho, which I think is the more popular style of pho, rather than the Saigon Ho Chi Minh style pho. $13.50 for pho, not bad, about $15. All right guys, we're having pho in the Asian quarters right now, and this is at a highly recommended spot, Pho Dao Ball. You got the, I believe the A Choi, super fragrant. You have the basil here, very fragrant. And also one thing I noticed here, is that this is a southern style pho spot and they have the red bird's eye chilies. Usually in America, they're gonna give you jalapenos. So I'm just gonna put a couple of them in there because uh, <laughs> the person I'm with likes it spicy, but I don't like it too spicy. So I think right off the bat, I gotta judge the pho broth. And the way I judge pho broth is basically if I wanna drink more of it just by itself. That's good. That's good. I got the pho tie. I didn't get the pho dak bit with all the crazy stuff in it, you know, cause uh, the, you know, we weren't trying to eat all that. But look at this beef. This is very high quality beef and I think they give you a decent amount. Now this bowl of pho maybe is a, a dollar or two more than average, but there's spots in Chinatown, New York that cost this much. Here we got the meatball. Let me just taste this beef real quick. Let's go. Try the noodles. Mmm. Wow, the noodles are stretchy, springy. Kind of have that snap to them. That's how I like it. I like I like the noodles having a stretch. And the soup is kind of like got a little like cinnamon, uh, strong cinnamon vibe to it or like cardamom to it. So I really like that. The spices are on point. Here we have the bambat lak, I believe is how I say it. But they're like these little clear tapioca dumplings with the little fried shallots on top. This is not a dish that they serve at every Viet restaurant, even in the West Coast, let alone obviously New York. The clear dumpling skin was a little bit thick, but taste-wise, good overall, guys. This pho, I think it's definitely better than the average New York pho, for sure. I heard some friends say Vietnamese food is nothing special out here, but I'm not gonna say it's better than the West Coast, you know, not better than like, I don't want to say it's better than OC, Westminster, San Jose, but I might say it's definitely better than the average East Coast spot. I got to try some more out here. That's a good start though. Uh, bonjour, je suis à Paris. C'est mon premier visite. Je mange beaucoup uh, de plats asiatiques. All right, guys, the pho was actually really good. So I think, I don't know, pho in Paris, pretty good. I'm going to say it's like West Coast level, but anyways, uh, I gotta try bun mi next, and I don't know if this is the best bun mi spot, but it's highly rated and it specializes in bun mi. It's called bun mi 88 on the same street. And across the street, you have some newer spots, but I'll tell you this about bun mi's. Not every Viet spot even serves a bun mi. So the last spot we were at eating pho, they don't serve a bun mi, which to me is a good sign because they're not trying to do too much and they're not trying to serve a mid-level bun mi. They're just trying to let the bun mi guys specialize in it. So anyways, this spot looks pretty authentically like, you know, Vietnam with kind of the uh, shop vibe. So let's go check it out. Bonjour. Bonjour. Everybody's nice. You just say bonjour to everybody. So here, you, 
you can look at it. Five euros? Guys, I think we have to talk about something. The prices here are insanely low for bun mi. Like, this is like, this is like California 2008 prices. Like, this is, I don't know how long this bun mi is, but for five dollars, or which is essentially six euro, six dollars, five euros is about six dollars. That's so cheap. Look, you have all the little crispy shrimp uh, um, contents, you know, from Vietnam, so you know the spot is very authentic. I'm very excited. Look at this. Doesn't that look like a TikTok video when they're in Saigon and they're just slapping the meat on, slapping the pate on, slapping on the pork floss and the, and the fried onions and... Ah. Uh, yeah. 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 So the owner is from Saigon. He does speak some Cantonese. Yeah. All right, everybody. Here we have the bomb meat that be it, the special bomb meat, and it was only five euros. That's six dollars American. Let's check this out, guys. So I will say this. You know, in Paris, in France, they don't put too much meat. You know, it's uh, not the biggest meat culture, but they have pate. They got the special meat. They have the pork floss. They have the uh, the fried onions. Everything that you need. Not a lot of cucumbers in this one. Not a lot of the daikon, so that's a little bit different. But this is on a French baguette, not a Vietnamese baguette, which is a little bit different. But look at that. Guys, you're not getting this bread in America. I'm not going to lie. So thin meat. Very cheap though, five euros. Oh my gosh. Actually, taste wise, taste wise is really good. Not a lot of meat. I'm used to more meat, but I think the French baguette, it always tricks me because it seems very hard at first, but then as you chew it just a few times, it just falls apart and disintegrates. Mmm. If I had to compare it to something in America, it'd be like a Lee's sandwich price. Like, literally, bun mi's in New York is like at least $11. At least $10 or $11. So this is six. So that's comparable to a Lee's sandwich price. I would say even Lee's is like, I think, $8 now, $9 now. So this is definitely better than Lee's. Um, no offense to Lee's sandwiches, but man, this was pretty good. Uh, maybe not the utmost top level bun mi I've ever had, but I'm sure there's different levels to bun mi out here as well. I just went to the kind of very like cheap, affordable to go spot, but I'll say this, the owner was nice, the baguette is nice, flavor is really good, has a little bit extra like fish sauce and a little bit more of those Vietnamese elements that I would only get at, I would get, uh, there's a spot called uh, uh, Saigon Vietnamese Sandwich over on Broom Street in New York City that kind of puts a lot of that dried shrimp and the little crumbled pork and stuff like that. Mmm. Oh. All right, guys, we are outside of Bun Mi Dao Ball, uh, other rated, highly rated Bun Mi spot. And now here's the thing. When I judge Bun Mi, I don't, there's not a clear list of which one was the absolute best Bun Mi. So I'm just going to highly rated spots that specialize in Bun Mi's. And so if it's good, I feel like that's a pretty good like kind of like metric to go off of. Um, so yeah, who could, who knows? It might be from the same family as Pho Dao Bo. I think the same spot that we ate at earlier. So my, this might be their Bun Mi spot versus that's their Pho spot. So anyways, let's go check it out. They have different sizes, a petite size, a small size, and a, I think a grand size, a big size. Let's go. Bonjour, bonjour. Can I get one petite, petite satay? And maybe one hiu nong. So I'm gonna get two petite sandwiches and they are only about four euros each. That's less than five dollars. These are the smaller size, but actually even the smaller size you can see is actually still kind of big. Oh, she just cut off part of it. So that's, she just made, she cut, that's a grand size and then she just cut off part of it to make it petite. Is it same family as Pho Da Bao? Ah. We just went there. We just ate at Pho, Pho Dao Bao. Yeah, it's good, it's good. They're gonna pull it out. 
and then she's gonna put the meat in as fire. All right, guys, we're here at the second bun me spot, uh, bun me dal ball, and oh my gosh, that saute is leaking through the bag. We got two small sizes, and this was only 760 euros. 760 euros, that's like less than $9 American, okay? That is an insane price. Look at this. Okay, all right, so the beef saute kind of flew out everywhere. Let me just take a look at this. The, oh my gosh. Oh my God. Let me just put that in there. Let me tuck it in. Four euros. Crazy. That did not skimp on the meat. The bread doesn't cut up the top of your mouth. Comparing bun mees in Paris to New York, they're way cheaper. The bread is better. I'd say maybe they put a little bit less mayo, a little bit less butter, but I'm sure that's easily solvable. You can just add more. Again, definitely better than New York, and I would say the bread is definitely better than your average West Coast bun mee too. For the same price. I think the price is what's really mind-blowing to me. I think the flavors are good. I think the baguette is really good, but the price? 380 euros, 380. Do you, uh, that, do you understand? That's like less than $5 American. That is crazy. That's not even, you can't even get that anywhere in America. All right, here I gotta try the grilled pork. Not the, not the chashu one, but the uh, other grilled pork, which is like the Chinese um, siuyo, kind of like pork belly. Oh my gosh. Look at this little torpedo here. All right, this is the grilled pork belly one. Again, only 380 euros. Guys, the price is insane. I'm just gonna twist it and break it in half. Mmm. Oh. Let's go. No. Oh. One of the best bumming bites I've had in a long time. Price, dollar for dollar better than america dollar for dollar better than america baguette is nicer crunchy crispy still falls apart not too chewy this one has plenty of mayo maybe it's because i got to the middle of it but i could survive off this man the dao ball family i don't know what you guys are doing but you guys are killing it in paris's chinatown the quick fit is the attic. they got it on lock man so good Via food in Paris is not bad at all. It's very good. All right, guys, here I'm at one of the most popular spots in all of Chinatown, and I'm just basing this off of what I've seen. And it's highly populated with women of all ages, uh, older and younger women. This is called Male Patisserie. And it's actually right across from Bun Me 88. Anyways, I got the Super Al Fruits. This is like the Super Fruit Tea, kind of like similar to a Yi Fang Fruit Tea with all the apples. You have passion fruit, you have lime, you have some oranges in there. This is uh, probably green tea. It's one of my favorite ways to drink tea. And one thing I noticed is that the workers here, they're Chinese and a lot of them are Wenzhou knees. Now, Wenzhou is like uh, a small part that is not as well known in America. In New York City, there's, uh, I would say a good amount of Wenzhou knees and Fujinese, but Wenzo is a lot of Wenzhou people in France and Italy as the primary uh, Chinese. So for some reason, the Wenzhou knees came from Wenzhou and went to France and Italy more so than America. Uh, but there, Wenzo was one of the first provinces to get like uh, the, uh, the enterprising like certificate. So that's very like, has a lot of like a deep, business background, that's what I learned. Anyways. Oh. I don't wanna be like, I don't want this to be confirmation bias, but the fruit here is like more, I don't know, maybe this don't put too much sugar. They don't put too much syrup in these drinks. So I feel like the fruit stuff that I've had here feels more fresh and fruity. Obviously the produce is better, it has less pesticides, that is a fact of France in general. Pretty good. I did see them use ca canned pineapples for this, so maybe pineapples is hard to get in Paris. 
It's good. I like it quite sour, but not too sweet. I didn't even have to say adjust the sugar or anything. In America, this would be me saying get like 25% sugar, but this was like the standard. Because you know, in the standard of America, drinks are probably a little too sweet. So, mole patisserie on Dievre. I, I'm not saying it right, sorry guys. Dievre Street, the main street, it's pretty good. Another thing I found interesting was talking to a lot of the servers here and they're speaking French and Mandarin and they're kind of blending the two. So it's kind of like, um, uh, Franderin, you know what I mean? You know how we have Chinglish, which is Chinese and English? This is like, uh, 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 Fryanese, because it's accented with French and Chinese. So it kind of almost sounds like Shanghainese, or maybe it's also influenced by Wenzhou, and Wenzhou, I'm not exactly sure about the dialect, but it might be a little bit, sound more Frenchy or more Shanghainese, which, to me, it sounds a little bit more French. All right, everybody, our next spot is a spot that I was just walking by and I decided to walk into called Uncle King's. They have a very unique restaurant, and we walked in at a time when they were technically open, but the server was kind of on his dinner break, and then this uh, lady was kind of like, hey, can I order now? And then he's like, all right, all right, all right, let me get up. And then he stopped eating. But look at the, look at the, how this restaurant is designed. They have like a seating area, and then up here, they have more seats and it faces out to the street. Very interesting. All right, here is the pork rojamo, AKA kind of like your Chinese hamburger, except usually made with pork. And this is at Uncle King's, this was 750 euros, which comes out to about $8.30. So I'm not gonna lie, not very cheap, but it has everything that I need. It has a flaky uh, bing, and then it has the peppers inside, chopped with the pork belly, and this looks, this looks top tier, right? So this is not cheaper necessarily than America, but I think it might be better than America because a lot of rojamos, they're almost like thick bread, like manto, but look how flaky this is. I trust the French pastry influence. Some roll jamos are like this, but it's hard to find them. Oh my gosh. Mm. No, that's fire. The workers in Boston at this restaurant, they're all from different parts of China. They probably met here. The servers from Guangxi, you got people from uh, Hunan, you got people from Xi'an, the chef is from Xi'an, hence the Roja more. this is where that dish comes from. Oh my God. One of the best Roja Moors I ever had, to be honest, like, one of the more expensive ones too, but I wanna be honest, it's juicy, it's delicious. I'm gonna add some smala. I did bring smala here. Does get clogged once in a while. Yeah. This is my favorite rojamo I've ever had. Feels more like a tuna thing, like a scallion pancake type. You gotta try it. Oh my god, man! Who said food in Paris is not good? Who said that? Who said that? Look at this cool restaurant too. Got the little uh, thermostat for the water too. It's fun, it's fun out here. All right, I've just learned from the waiter here. He's from Guangxi, but he told me that obviously different Roja Mo's come from different regions, right? Every region kind of does its own thing. And I was just saying most of the ones that I've had, minus the exception of a few, it's more of the Manto bready style, right? Where it's very thick um, and almost pretty much like a bread burger bun, but it hyper dense but this is a Tongguan Rojamo, okay? It's from a certain spot in Xi'an, and this is the style because I think the chef is from there. So it's Tongguan Rojamo, and it has the flaky crust. It's not bready, but it's flaky. Almost like an extreme scallion pancake. Mine's the scallions, but extra flaky, like a crispy croissant covering. It makes sense that in France, they would want the more croissant style, so. I almost ate the whole thing, guys. And I've already eaten a bunch of food already, so that's how good it is out here. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, oh, save room for more. Hey everybody, I'm not gonna lie to you. I wanna eat at so many more spots in the Paris Chinatown, AKA Couture Asiatique, but I just have limited stomach space, limited time and limited funds. But I just wanna shout out, there's Bun Me 13, which I would totally try if I had space, if I didn't already film at two Bun Me spots. There's actually an Aldi's here, oddly enough. Aldi is from Europe, by the way. And then of course they have your Xing Fu Tang, right? Which is your famous Taiwanese chain. They also have a Yifang fruit tea right here or down there. There's a Yifang fruit tea. So they have some of the big Taiwanese chains out here um, because I actually, I'm not gonna lie. Like even though most of these spots are Vietnamese, which makes sense because uh, due to the colonization of the French in Vietnam, that most spots here would be Vietnamese. And um, quite a few spots are just straight Vietnamese. Some of them are Chinese Vietnamese owned and some of these are just Chinese owned. Um, the Chinatown's not small here. It's not small at all. I'm actually impressed. I had this impression that it was gonna be a lot smaller. I'd watched some other YouTube videos um, about uh, how it only looked like there was just like six bun mi shops in Chinatown. Maybe that was old, but I'm gonna tell you this, it's a solid Chinatown. I'm impressed and I've been to a lot of Chinatowns in my life. Uh, so I'm gonna try a couple restaurants that I wanted to go to are closed because I'm in that time zone where it's between at, when it's after lunch and before dinner. So a lot of spots close, open at six or seven. Um, some of the spots I wanted to go to is open at seven. I don't have time to go there, so I'm not gonna wait for it, but don't worry, Paris Chinatown is solid out here, but I'm gonna go, I gotta get some uh, Cantonese food and gotta get some siu mei. So I'm about to go here, restaurant Flores de Mai. I saw it has decent reviews. I'm gonna get some like siu op, roast duck, maybe some cha shu, you know, I just gotta check it out. See that it's on par with America, I'm sure it is because the poultry out here is actually, I would say better than New York. All right, everybody, I'm outside of Restaurant Flores de Mai. I don't know how to say it, but basically I got one big serving. Okay, so you know what they gave me? And because I was confused because I ended up paying a lot more money than I thought. But uh, basically they gave me a lot of roast duck. They gave me two uh, e, e ping fonds actually. So two meats. Anyways, uh, this spot's not super cheap, but I don't know, it looks high quality. Let's check it out. Dark flavor is good. Rice is good, fluffy. Chashu. Sweet. Okay. I'd say it's solid. Definitely nothing bad about it. I think one thing is that what I realized is in um, Paris Chinatown, there's not, it's not as Cantonese focused. So it's like, as American Chinatowns are more a Toysan, kind of like Gong Zhao, like Guangzhou focused, or, or that's kind of like the people who help build those places. I think the Paris Chinatown, it's less based in kind of like the Cantonese cuisine, even though there's some good Cantonese restaurants out here. So I don't think that the roast meat industry out here is as big. Tastes good. The duck is high quality, but I wouldn't say that this is anything crazy. So that's what's interesting coming to different Chinatowns is that, and this is not my quote by the way, but I saw this in another video, someone was describing the experience of Chinese in America. And a lot of it is like lower middle class or middle class immigrants coming to America and catering to the American middle class. I think it's just a different immigration wave in Paris. So it's not like all, uh, it's not primarily like middle or lower middle income Cantonese people that came over. So that's why it's just different. That's why maybe it doesn't have all the awnings that look like um, your typical Chinatown because I went to the Yokohama Chinatown, which is in Tokyo, essentially. And it kind of reminds me of this Paris one in that the streets are bigger. It's not like a, I guess I would say immigrant enclave as much. It doesn't give that vibe. But anyways, the duck is overall pretty good. See the skin. Poultry's good out here. But yeah, nothing amazing. For the... Well, onward we go. 
one of the interesting things about walking into even non-Vietnamese restaurants in the Asian area is that even at the Chinese spots that are owned by Chinese people, they will still have spring rolls or fresh rolls and the Vietnamese egg rolls on the menu. So it's kind of like because there's so much Viet food and people are so exposed to Viet food that even the Chinese spots still offer an, a Viet egg roll. And these are like mainland, like northern owned spots. So that's something that you would just not see in America. That's very different because Vietnamese food is the is kind of the uh, the the narrative out here. So just as maybe a lot of non Shanghainese spots or just every Chinese spot is going to serve like a shalom bao, like soup dumpling in New York City, almost every Chinese restaurant serves like a Viet spring roll. One of the Cantonese restaurants that I meant to go to is Imperial Suaze. I saw this on Instagram, but I just don't have time or the stomach space for it. But yes, I heard this spot's pretty good. So check this out, Imperial Suaze. All right, everybody, I'm just going off the beaten path here. There's this like really interesting gate here that you go into. That's just an interesting guy. I'm gonna tell you this. In Paris, they got different types of like doorways and gates, all right? They've come up with different ideas on how to uh, control the flow of people. Anyways, um, like any good Chinatown, there is a new world something. As you can see, this is kind of like some housing complex here. I revised what I meant to say is that the Chinatown here actually reminds me of Toronto's Chinatown a little bit. The streets are bigger. The structures kind of look like Toronto a little bit. Here, I'm going in this New World Mall. Is that a Thai buffet? Oh, shoot. And then here, we have some older Cantonese restaurants. You know, I would assume that these restaurants are probably kind of similar to your like late night, like Canto spots, uh, heavily serving non-Chinese. That's who I see in the window. The other spots that I saw had more Chinese, but yeah, basically, I don't know what this place is. I don't know who lives here, but. All right, everybody. It is nightfall and our next spot is called Mashil. It is a Korean restaurant in the 15th arrondissement. Let me take you in. Uh, this is a Korean restaurant and about the Korean. All right, so this right here is the beginning of our doboki plate and it's all gonna be cooked right here. And then here I have this uh, kimchi jjigae uh, katsu. And I believe that is that's an egg on top, not cheese. So you can see the yolk, the egg white right there. Ooh. This is the kimchi jjigae tonkatsu. Mmm. Wow. That kimchi jjigae kind of tastes like a, almost has like a spicy tomatoey vibe, so it kind of works. Mmm. So what happens is the katsu is no longer crispy. It has soaked up a lot of the kimchi jjigae sauce. This is just the skin, but it's still very tasty. So I get all the katsu flavor, but just not the texture. Mmm. I like it. It's the first time I've ever had this dish. Wow. I'm coming to Paris and I'm eating Korean dishes I've never had. Okay, this is the kimchi jjigae. It is cooked now. It's a very dark in flavor. Are you guys, is it too hot for you? Oh, they got the little silicone mitts. I would say Korean food is very efficient in that matter. I really like how Koreans cut stuff with scissors too. So it has some of the japchae noodles, huh? The potato noodles mixed in with the ramen noodles, mixed in with cabbage. <clears throat> you have your little sausage links. You got your eggs, uh, odin, which is the uh, fish cakes. All right, everybody. I'm not the biggest fan of tteokbokki, as you guys know, but this is a highly rated dish and very highly recommended from tteokbokki lovers. You get the noodles first. Mmm. Wow, that was good. Sweet, not too sweet. Oh. The tteokbokki cooked really nicely. Mmm. Little smoky links.
what I like about this dish is that the gochujang flavor is actually not too strong. This almost feels like a Korean barbecue sauce with some gochujang in it. And it's really not too sweet though. But ultimately, I like this. I could rock with it. Plus it's got a lot of other stuff going on. Seaweed with potato noodle roll. Mmm. That was the best bite. The seaweed roll. You gotta, you gotta try the seaweed roll. It's really good. All right, everybody, our next spot is called The Coffee. It is a Japanese coffee chain that's very popular in Paris. They take Brazilian coffee, they perfect it with the Japanese techniques, you know what I'm saying? Um, it's called The Coffee, so it's kind of hard to find if you Google it because it's just called The Coffee. But anyways, this is their seasonal drink. This is a honey lemon espresso latte. And basically, it's gonna be like honey lemonade with a two shot espresso poured on top. That's pretty good. This came highly recommended from my camera person's cousin who's been staying in Paris for a while. It's super rainy, but I'm not gonna lie, this is very refreshing. I like this a lot. I think more and more people should be doing kind of like a citrusy lemonade with coffee. I think they should do it more often. I know it's big in Asia, and I always love these drinks in Asia, and they're coming to the West, but Paris first, hopefully New York soon. But this is good, very good, I highly recommend. All right, everybody, our first spot is Quan Hanoi. And uh, right now we got the Hanoi style pho, which is the northern style pho. And as you can see, I'll let me bring the bowl up. It's super hot though, I'm trying to get the camera up. That the noodles are the wide kind of noodles. And I think this is the one of the main uh, differences right off the bat between this and a lot of Vietnamese American spots because also the menu is different They actually serve the porridge the jiao um, Which actually most Viet spots in America will not serve. So that's really interesting. So let's just get into it, man mm, I love northern style pho though. It's super beefy very oniony Cut straight to the point. Okay That's good northern pho is hard to find in America at least on the East Coast I'd say that's pretty good. It is a bit salty. I would say maybe a little bit saltier than I thought, but wow. Mm. And this is nice right here with the garlic and chilies. I might just have to throw a couple in there. Why not? Bang. Bang. This is the first meal in Paris. Gotta thank my girlfriend here for letting us get Vietnamese food for the first meal in Paris. This is literally the first thing we've eaten. So also, I have the bung khun, and what I notice about this is that it's very translucent, um, as you can see, and then there's a ton and a ton of just fried onions on top. So let's see if this is any good. This nook mom right here, they have the little uh, ham in there, which is a little bit different. Mm. It's good. They do things just a little bit differently here. Now it's time to try the jayo. Fried egg roll. Let's dip it first. Mmm. That was good. Tasted pretty similar to something I've had in the States, so. Honestly, right off the bat, I would've gotten a lot more of the deeper cut items, but they actually ran out of them. It's about 5 p.m. right now, so they kind of ran out of food, but so far, guys, I'm gonna say this, Vietnamese food in Paris, pretty good. Very comparable. This was about 12, 90 euros, so maybe that comes out to 15, 16 dollars. So not necessarily any cheaper, but that's really not that expensive either when you think about beef, so. Yeah, one last thing, guys, one last thing. I did bring Smala on the plane, shout out to them. Shout out to TSA for letting the six ounce bottle through, but I'm just gonna sprinkle just a little bit on the outside. Just a little bit. 
That's that spice. That's people what sriracha they're working with. This is the one. This comes from, uh, have you guys seen this brand? This is uh, Produit de Chine. This is from France. This is imported by France. Let's taste it. I'm gonna do a little bit of this hoisin, the Amoy brand. Not necessarily the main brand I would use in America. Let's do that. Mm. Mm. And one funny little thing is that this table is actually built <coughs> around this like post in the street that's like immovable. So it's already been here. So they were like, oh, let us cut out the table around it. All right, everybody. I'm at the McDonald's at Champs Elysees. I believe it's Champs. How do I say it? Guys, we're right down the street from the Arc de Triomphe, you know, that big arc there. Uh, I just spent uh, 17 euros here. I got the Diet Coke, of course. I need that to keep going. I got nine, not 10, but nine chicken nuggets with barbecue sauce and Sichuan sauce, yes. So let's see if this McDonald's is any good, but really I think the item that I really wanna show you guys is this Greek Mac. This is the one, I, there's a lot of different items on the menu here. They got a maple uh, Big Mac, they have a uh, the Big and Tasty, they have like a filet fish Ultimate, but this, This is the Greek Euro version of a Big Mac right here. They kind of like take the slabs of meat, they have the patties, and then they just put it there. I just think they have a basic tzatziki sauce or kind of like cream sauce, and they're just gonna put that in there. So I'm gonna tell you if it tastes anything like a Greek Euro. I don't think you guys have to get this one. <laughs> It's not better than a regular Big Mac. Let's try the chicken nuggets real quick. That like bread was kind of weird. Let's get the chicken nugget, Sichuan sauce. Tangy, not bad. Let's get small on there. The chicken nugget is less salty than the one in America. Small eyes, even. The real Sichuan sauce right here. Anyways, beads. Would you like to try one? What is that? That's Sichuan sauce. Oh, that's definitely not Sichuan sauce. <laughs> <laughs> that's like more of a sweet and sour sauce, if anything. So it's not they, bad. They did have the they did have this sauce called sauce chinois, which was the I think the sweet and sour sauce here. So, because you know chinois means Chinese. So, anyways, overall uh, French McDonald's. I got to try more, but the uh, Greek Mac is a no go. I think there's other items here that are better. All right, so my overall take on the French McDonald's when I've been here is that actually the meat tastes like a little bit more pure meat. Like the beef patty almost tasted more like you made it at home. So a little bit less flavor, a little bit less salt, a little bit probably less preservatives, a little bit cleaner tasting. I don't want to say tastier, but it was definitely cleaner tasting. Uh, they put the Coke in this coffee cup with like the little like cardboard coffee top that was kind of I guess they're trying to do away with plastic maybe but I'm drinking my diet coke like a coffee and then the uh, barbecue sauce I felt like was less a little bit less sweet and a little bit more like I want to say tangy but anyways I think it's safe to say that the quality of meat 
out in France that I've had is definitely more like, I guess you can kind of taste how it has less preservatives, to be honest. And I think that is something I noticed even from the chicken leg I had earlier down to even the beef that I had in my pho. So I think that is one thing to note. I don't think it's necessarily tastier because I think in America they focus on pumping it full of salt water or juices or I guess hormone growth to grow the meat really big. And that's why, you know, beef is really affordable in America. But I'll tell you this, definitely the meat in France tastes more organic. All right, everybody, I'm out in Florence, Italy, uh, and I'm about to try this McDonald's because I had to take a break from Paris real quick. It's very hot. I am wearing a tank top. I know that's not my usual attire, but there's a lot of mosquitoes out, so I don't know why that would mean that I should wear a tank top. I shouldn't be wearing a tank top, but anyways, let's see what they got at the Italian McDonald's. All the kiosks are open. Let's go over here. Excuse me, let me see. All right, we got the McChicken creation. I love the McChicken. Uh, images, let's just go to English, make it simple for myself. All right, let's do it. Eat in. McChicken creations, delicioso. So they have the McRap gustoso, McChicken gustoso. Let's see what other sandwiches they have. As you can see, that's not in America, that's not in America. This Parmigiano Reggiano in pear sauce, whoa. I'm gonna get that pear sauce one. Cause that's like, sounds like some, you know, you're not gonna get anywhere else. You know what this Reggiano pear sauce, let's, let's, let's get more, let's get more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Add to order. So that's 850 euros, that's pretty expensive. That's about more than $9. Should I get this double chicken BBQ? These are your regular items, standard items. Spicy nuggets, let's go. Hot devil hot sauce, yes. Getting one. Okay. I wanted to get another sauce though. I gotta try if they have a, a Chinese sauce. Temptations and sauces, that's hilarious. And the Riche fries. Mayonnaise, mustard, barbecue sauce, seed and sour. Barbecue sauce. Hold on, did I see Parmesan on the menu? Parmesan, let's get the Parmesan steak. Uh, chicken wings, oh my gosh, Italian panzerotti. I don't wanna get the tri-basket, man. This is too crazy, but uh, chicken or the panzerotti. Nah. I gotta get the item that you can't get in other McDonald's. All right, everybody, let's check out Italian McDonald's. You got the devil's hot sauce right here. Let's see if it's kind of like a Calabrian chili one. Mmm, that's spicy. <coughs> that's actually really spicy. <laughs> Y'all win on that one. As I'm really excited about this one, they have the pear sauce. Let's take a look. I got, oh my God, that has a salami. I didn't even know that. Extra pear sauce, extra cheese. Let's go in. Mm. The pear sauce is nice. The grilled onions are nice. That tastes like one of those burgers you have to buy off like one of those specialty menus. It's like more expensive, because you know in America, caramelized onions, pear sauce, those are considered high-end items. Let's try the spicy nuggets. They're very orange. Mm. That's good. Hey, the spicy nuggets got some heat to them. I'm not gonna lie, guys. When they say it's spicy out here, it's spicy. I got this extra stick of Parmesan. I don't really know what to do with it. I'm just gonna crumble it here. Oh, bang. Let's open this up. It's like a little pizza pocket. Oh, it's good. It probably came frozen out of a box, but it's good. 
these cheese and bacon fries, I'm not gonna lie, don't look very good, but let's check them out. Cheese could have been better. I'm gonna dip it in the devil sauce. Overall, Italian McDonald's, better than Paris McDonald's, better than the French McDonald's. More flavor, more things, actually tastes higher end. It almost tastes like a, a level up from like a uh, more premium burger that you would get in America. So I would say the Italian McDonald's is good in my book. Okay, everybody. Uh, I had to transfer real quick out of Paris and we had to come to Florence, Italy. First of all, we're just shooting this out of order, but I had to get the pho in Florence, Italy because I wanted to try it. And there was two Vietnamese spots. One was, to be honest, lower rated and one was higher rated. This is the higher rated new one, so we're coming here. But I gotta try, this is Hanoi style pho ball Thai chin. Um, sorry, I butchered the name, but the noodles should be a little bit wider. It's funny on the menu, they call it tagliatelle uh, de, de riso. So it's like, you know, rice tagliatelle, which is their term for the noodles. But let's check it out. The greens, they got these long little um, sprouts here as usual, but then the salad looks a little different. This almost looks like a mixed green salad. So I'm just gonna squeeze a little bit of lime in before I taste it. But uh, this is Hanoi style pho after all, because you also have the uh, Dom Toy, I believe you call it. It's like the pickled garlic. That's more for Hanoi style pho. And then this is the uh, grilled steak. So let me try this. It's piping hot. Mm. Lots of nice shaved green onions, Julian. I like that. Guys, I'm trying pho in Paris, Italy. I'm letting you know how it goes. Mmm, okay, kind of sweet. It does kind of remind me of the Hanoi pho that I've had in LA. Mmm, this is good. As you guys know, in Florence, they're known for the Bisteca de Florentine, which is like the Florentine steak. So I think that, I think the beef out here is, is good. They, they have a high, standard for it. Mm. Take a look. Very clean broth. I would say definitely surprising for Italy. I would say, man, this pho, if it was even in America, anywhere in pretty much any standard city would be considered pretty good. I wonder if like kind of the Italian or Parisian Kind of techniques rub off on the Asian food out here, especially the pho. I, I, it's hard to tell, but I can tell you that it's really not bad. Like, if you could get this in America, I would order this for 13 euros. Mm. Texture of the rice noodle is really good, man. Shoot, man, where's all the viets at? I will say this, that there are Vietnamese here, and if you were looking for any ABG type people, they might be hanging out here. I'm just saying, it's a new Viet spot, a new Viet cafe, you know what it is. All right, real quick, I gotta try it with the Dom Toy. This is the pickled garlic. Mm. Yo, I was the bite. This is delicious right here. Is it in oil? Oh my gosh. Nah, this is fire. This is this is the bite. This is the bite to get. Pickled garlic with the Hanoi pho. Mmm, sweet garlic. Is this an olive oil? That would make sense if it was olive oil. That's fire. This is the best pickled garlic I remember ever having, honestly. The best Vietnamese pickled garlic was in Florence, Italy. All right, guys, we got the pho here at Le Saigon d'Anton. This spot is one of the highest rated Vietnamese restaurants in all of Paris. It's right across the street from the Garden of Luxembourg, beautiful garden. They give you the fish sauce and the nook mom in a pitcher. They're doing things different. Here, I put all the greens in. They even give you the lemongrass. So I'm going to stick that in. This is uh, 
southern style pho. Actually, the noodles look a little bit wider. So actually, I'm not really sure what style of pho this is, but because the noodles look almost more like Hanoi style, but it could be southern style. Could this be some of the best pho in Paris? Soup is beefy, kind of salty, but not a bad thing. Let me add some of the accoutrements. A little dab. One thing I will say about pho in Paris is that the noodles are on point and they're chewy and stretchy and that's how I prefer it. So, man, overall, really solid. This bumbo uh, chicken, I don't know the name, but it, look at the grilled chicken. Delicious. Anyways, the Saigon Dion Top. All right, everybody, we are at a spot that has been highly recommended by a chef friend in New York City. We're at Hanoi 1988. It is in another beautiful part of the city, uh, right next to the Louvre. There's, uh, you can see the Paralympics balloon. You're at the bridge, you're at the water. I mean, it looks great. And uh, I'll be honest, most of the patrons are not necessarily Asian, but I will tell you this, this is the Pho Hanoi super garlicky that's what they call it and this was recommended also by one of the workers there so you can see it is pho hanoi with the kind of like minced beef slightly cooked long wide noodles lots of greens in there we have the red chili peppers which they do more here uh they don't give you jalapenos that's an american thing mostly oh let me just throw in one of those green peppers too yeah just to <laughs> color it up you know and i'm gonna squeeze before I squeeze some lime, I'm about to taste it, so. That puree and garlic, wow, has a lot of flavor. <laughs> Not too much lime right here. Let's check it out. Man, I really like the broth. The noodles? Decent. I don't love the noodles, but I really like this broth. Dang. Guys, I can taste all that parsley and cilantro right in there, too. I like the beef, the boof. I really like that broth though, man. Guys. <coughs> I <coughs> got one of the chilies down my throat. <coughs> Maybe there's no uh, perfect pho, but this one has a really good broth. Check out Hanoi 1988. If you want to be in a really nice area and eat Vietnamese food in Paris. everybody uh, I got some sleep and we had to start off the day with the best baguette in all of Paris it won the 2024 award um, this is the boulangerie utopia we took two trains to get out here as you can see look at that baguette we already started eating it I'm gonna rip it uh. oh look at that stretch very good I'm not a baguette as expert, but I gotta give it like nine, nine out of 10, 9.5. I mean, if this is something that I just wanna eat, I don't even love bread that much, but the fact that I can just eat it, I appreciate it. So, didn't just get baguettes so Had to get the croissant, look at this thing. It's so squishy. And it almost broke when I grabbed it. 
Look at that. Crazy man. Oh my gosh. Wow. No. That was definitely one of the best croissants I ever had. Wow. Got the chocolate one. Should be chocolate at least. Chocolate Alpen. Oh! Got a little bit of chocolate there. That was crazy. That was actually the best thing I had. This was the best croissant, best chocolate croissant I've ever had in my life. Last thing we're trying is the cheese roll, guys. There are hornets all over this thing because I guess hornets love the bread. This is a cheese roll with chorizo, meaning that, I think chorizo just meaning like, I don't know, steak, meat. Doesn't mean what, you know, we think in Spanish. Mmm, maybe it is a Spanish chorizo. That's so good. All right. There's amazing bakeries in New York City, to be honest, but kitchens. There's amazing bakeries in New York City, but I can see why people love France. Ooh. This man is pulling the chicken out of the rotisserie air fryer. And we have the chicken. All right, everybody, for five euros, I got a fresh, straight out of the rotisserie uh, chicken leg and gravy. Okay, so let's just take a, go ahead, look inside and just peel it off. It's super hot, I have gravy in my hand. I don't even know if this is like against French culture to do this, but oh, look at that, guys. Crispy on the skin. I waited like 15 minutes for it. My girlfriend kind of got mad at me. She was like, are you really gonna wait for chicken? I was like, yeah. Gonna wait for the chicken. Mmm. The gravy is banging. Chicken tastes very high quality. It's not pumped up with juices. Wow. I'm gonna. I'll just you. The things that stand out to me is the chicken quality. Cooking method wise, I mean, I think you can make really good chicken out of the air fryer at home. But I'm not gonna lie, this gravy is crazy. Gravy gets 10 out of 10. Super, super deep, rich. Is that beef or chicken flavor? I'm assuming the gravy is, it tastes beef. It tastes like beef actually. So it's like beef gravy with chicken. Um, overall, on the streets of Paris for five euros, I'd say it's worth it. Mm. All right, everybody, so what I've made is I've taken some baguettes from earlier from Utopia, the best baguette 2024, winner of the Grand Prix baguette competition. I've put some of the chicken in it, and then I'm gonna dip it into the gravy and this is actually a sandwich I was making for my girlfriend here. She didn't want to just eat the chicken straight up, but can I take the first bite? I think I just created my own pair of street food right there. That's rotisserie chicken with a baguette. Fire. All right, everybody, I'm here at the Pierre Hermé Cafe. This is one of the famous cafe chains out here by this guy, the macaron god. Anyways, uh, my girlfriend saw the spot on Instagram, so we're here and we are trying the sorbet with lychee, raspberry, and rose. 
Let's take a look at that. Can you hold the bowl real quick for me? Oh, so this is the white part's the lychee part. You got the raspberry, the rose. It's called the Ispanhan, Isapanhan, I don't know. Anyways. Mm. It's really good. That's actually very sweet though, I'm not gonna lie. But the flavor is there. Need a little bit more. Mm. So I know this isn't an Asian restaurant, but he is serving an Asian fruit flavor at the cafe. This is not Asian, this is Americano. It's one of the hottest days in Paris. We just got off the plane, so we're walking around, we're sweating, super tired. I think, I don't know what time zone I'm on because I just got back from Seattle a day before. So uh, anyways, good stuff in Paris so far. The napkin here is like a linen pair of pants. It's so nice. I almost feel bad like wiping my stuff on there. No, let me see that that texture. Can you move zoom in? Oh. No, it's not even like paper. It's like linen. Yo, the details in Paris, it's like man. A, it's pants. These are pants and This is a handkerchief. <laughs> Alright everybody, I had to try the macarons here while we were at Pierre Hermé. Okay, here we have the chocolate with uh, passion fruit. All right, I never had that in New York. And then here's a rhubarb one. And uh, yeah, I mean, and then you have the cloth napkin here. So let's just start with the passion fruit because passion fruit is kind of an Asian flavor. Mm. There's like a layer of passion fruit. Can you see that on the bottom? Pretty good. I like how it's not hyper sweet, right? Sometimes macaroons are like, way just feel like sugar. Here's a rhubarb one, cool coloring. Rhubarb, as you guys are familiar with, rhubarb pie. Kind of a tart thing. I mean, I am in the land of macaroons and I'm at a spot that's famous for macaroons. They're pretty good. Maybe I wouldn't say mind blowing, but I think this rhubarb one's my favorite. Babe, I think you gotta try it. Pillowy outside. Nice and jelly on the inside. Both really good, unique. I haven't tried this in the in New York. What's your favorite? I think the chocolate one. The chocolate what? passion fruit. <laughs> what? All right, everybody, I'm in Florence, Italy, and I had to get some Chinese food because I wasn't eating so much Chinese food on this trip. I was eating mostly Vietnamese food, to be honest. Um, uh, but here, um, I'm at the Mercado Central, which is the central market, and I had to try the pork dumplings. This is the, tri the I don't know if it's supposed to be a shaolong bao or just a steam bao, but they told me to get the traditional one. So it's kind of like a big, feels like a big soup dumpling right now. But there's no spoon for the soup, so I guess don't eat it like a soup though. Dang! It broke apart. So it's not really a Shaolin Bao. It's just a soupy dumpling. It's just like a big baozi or like a jiaozi. The lady who was making it is actually from Fujian. Out. Ginger, a little bit of carrots in there, some scallions. Let's dip the meatball that fell out in the soy sauce. Pretty good. Does Italy have good Chinese food? So they're in the shape of a shallow bao, but you eat them like a jiao. Did bring small up. This spot is called Ravioli de Chinese. The Ravioli Chinese, aka Chinese dumplings. 
pretty good. I wouldn't say amazing, but has like a cool flavor to it. Um, kind of tastes like something you would get at a spot in New York, but maybe not the dollar dumpling spots, but perhaps a dumpling spot that is catering towards uh, a Western audience. So, not bad. All right, everybody, I know this is an Asian food, but this is an Argentinian steakhouse, and we tried to go to the Korean barbecue restaurant down the street, but it was closed. So I guess we're eating some of the better steak in the world. So we'll say, oddly enough, though, that these uh, beef ribs are actually pretty much short ribs that you would get at the Korean barbecue restaurant. Let's take a look. Oh, ho, ho. Thick cut, baby. All right, everybody, thank you so much for watching that video. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Here are my closing thoughts on Asian food in Europe. Uh, it's 12.30 a.m. right now. I'm about to fly out of Paris tomorrow. I'm in the hotel room. Uh, and I just wanted to remind you that these are just the conclusions I came to having eaten a lot of uh, food around the world and really only having limiting time, uh, limiting stomach space, and limiting money to spend right or else i probably would have eaten everywhere so i guess here are my thoughts about asian food in europe from what i know for first of all there are a surprising amount of korean restaurants and a lot of them look fairly new in the past like five years uh so i think that all kind of makes sense but over one, number one i would say the quality of food is generally good now what i mean by that is like the produce is good obviously italy and france have very very strict agricultural um like laws and stuff so they use i don't want to say zero pesticides but they use less pesticides and things generally taste honestly significantly different i would say the fruit tastes like more citrusy i know the tomatoes i can tell are really good there's certain fruits that i couldn't tell but i know the strawberries they look like not like the perfect strawberries that we have in our grocery stores in america like we, they look really funny out here so you kind of know they're organic i would say almost all the meats almost taste at least like organic American level. So whether it was beef or it was pork or even chicken, I got a rotisserie chicken, right? That tasted just like really high quality. Not not necessarily the plumpest, but it was because it wasn't like pumped up full of like salt water and stuff like that. Um, point number two, I feel like the percentage of northern Vietnamese restaurants or at least restaurants that say Hanoi on them or on their menu. Obviously there's a higher percentage of them in 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 France and uh, that's due to immigration and to Paris and Italy and, and has to do with, uh, you know, the war and everything, politics as well. But uh, overall, I wouldn't say that there's not as many Southerners, but I would say like between the Southern style Vietnamese restaurants and Northern style ones, it's like 50-50 split almost between Italy and France. So I think that goes to show you that that already makes Viet food a little bit different here. Um, also, I think that every Viet restaurant I went to had some all-star dishes, uh, but maybe the pho wasn't always the best one. But I would say that there is some pretty good pho, and I had it, and uh, I would say... No, there's some beautiful Vietnamese restaurants as well that, you know, were very cool to go to. Um, point number three, I would say many of the Chinese uh, immigrants owning the shops or uh, running the restaurants out here that I met were primarily Wanzhounese, Fujinese, and I would say those are the two main groups, but of course there's all other types. There are some Cantonese, there were some like, you know, people from Dongbei, the Northeast as well. But uh, I would say one of the things I thought about, and the reason why I didn't eat that much Chinese food on this trip, because you know that we eat so much Chinese food in America, but I kind of knew that the Chinese food out here wasn't going to be that, wasn't going to be better than Canada and America. Like, because Canada and America, they have, first of all, have great food, but they also have, like, a lot of the Chinese chefs that came over and, like, the groups of Chinese that have those super deep, like, food traditions. Like, I'm not going to lie, if it's, like, Wanzhounese and Fujinese, you, that means you're not getting as much Cantonese and, like, Sichuan Im immigrants, for example, you know, that those are, like, food regions so that's what i mean to say is that 
Um, there was some cool restaurants that I saw, like in Italy, there was this spot serving Huang Menji, which is like yellow braised chicken, which is like a super deep cut dish I wanted to try, but you know, we did, I only had limited time and I couldn't eat at every Chinese restaurant, you know? Um, so that, maybe that's why I didn't go out of my way. But, um, I also, another point I have is that I think that, um, like the French and Italian food cultures in these cities also affect the immigrant food, you know? Just as well as like Chinese American food, like Panda Express, like orange chicken, for example, it comes from America because it's essentially lower to middle class Chinese immigrants catering to middle class Americans. So the food is very sweet, like orange chicken is a product of that because it's kind of like fruity and syrupy. Um, but I feel like in France and Italy, because the food cultures are so deep, that also it might affect how maybe some Asian spots like present their food as well. You know what I mean? I can't say for everything, but I, I definitely think it affects it. Like maybe obviously for the bun mi, the, the baguette, they're using, a lot of them are using French baguettes. Some of them are using the via baguette, but most of them are using the French baguettes and French baguettes are amazing out here. Not only is it super cheap, but they're delicious. So that's why they're able to partially why they're also able to price it so low. And then, uh, yeah, I think, uh, baguettes are like rice it's so cheap like you can just get a long 14 15 inch baguette literally for like a dollar 30 yeah um and you i've seen multiple women walking around paris with a large baguette under their arms just taking a bite and eating it as they walk so i've seen that multiple times oh second of all i think the italian fast food chains are better than france obviously the italian mcdonald's because overall italian food is better than French food. Not that French food doesn't have its highlights. I think pastries, um, and it's oddly enough, French techniques are very, very highly touted, you know, but the food itself is good, but it's not great. It's not like mind blowing. And uh, yeah, you know, I mean, those are pretty much my thoughts on Asian food and food in general in, in Europe, but I had some really good meals. I also had some really super mid products. Like, man, some of the stuff I ate, I was not impressed by, but some of the stuff really lived up to the hype. So uh, overall, um, yeah, if you're looking to come to Viet, I mean, if you're looking to come to Paris for Vietnamese food, just note that uh, not every spot is going to do everything the best. But overall, the best spots I still found with the best value were in the Asian Enclave, like in Paris, the Quartier Asiatique, which is essentially the Chinatown or Asian town, you know, since it's primarily the Vietnamese. Um, but yeah, uh, anyways, hope that was helpful. I'll try to leave the links to the spots I remember down below, but I really don't. I can't remember every single restaurant I went to. Um, and I don't know the name of everyone. But anyways, thank you so much for watching. Hit that like button. Next video you see me in, I'm going to be in New York. So until next time, I'm out. Peace.